Mesdames et messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me okay? Thank you very much for coming, first of all, and staying for this uh, debate after the film. There are many of us here, and there are many of us listening over the internet as well. On the festival's website, um, this uh, discussion is being streamed. Um, but there is Real Madrid against Girona tonight, so that uh, may be some competition for us. I think that's the only thing that brings that is in common between uh, the speaker on the right and the speaker on the left. I think they're both for Girona. Is that right? Both Girona fans? We're going to talk about uh, the right of peoples to self-determination and who is entitled to self-determination. The Catalan crisis is going to be discussed throughout the discussion, but imagine that uh, you know that this is a very powerful issue, and so we are, will be talking about Catalonia, but uh, each of the speakers, according to their origin or sensibility, may uh, share or reject uh, other aspirations, such as Israelis, Palestinians, Serbs, uh, Albanians from Kosovo, Kurds, uh, Scots, uh, uh, the Jura region in Switzerland. It's a very long list, and the degree of uh, passion, of violence differs. We'll be talking about the right of peoples to self-determination, and uh, many of these rights were established here in Geneva, as Philip Motta was saying earlier on. So I propose to begin with that. Just a few words from each speaker on what they understand uh, as the right of peoples, Catalonia in particular, uh, to uh, uh, he he speaking here in Geneva. Um, Michelin Camiré, you are a professor now, and so you're a university teacher, and you uh, teach on issues very connected with this uh, issue and other international affairs. And uh, you have also had political experiences yourself, and others uh, will remember that you were president of Switzerland. Your presence, your presence here, what, what does it represent in, in just a few years, words? Well, I would have uh, preferred this debate to take place in Madrid or Barcelona, but Geneva is an important uh, place because Geneva is the capital of human rights. It's uh, where we have the, high com the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the High Commission for Refugees, we have the uh, Red Cross. So we talk about human rights here, and uh, we are at a festival here, um, which is the International uh, Film Festival and Forum for Human Rights. So we talk about uh, respect for human rights. And I was concerned uh, as to what happened in October last year in uh, Barcelona, in Catalonia more generally. I was concerned by the violence that was uh, employed against people who simply wanted to go and vote or express their views. And people were imprisoned for that. So I think it's important to talk about these human rights related issues here. And Geneva is also the uh, center of uh, arbitration and the first arbitration, international arbitration, took place here in Geneva. It's a place where we try to find solutions to problems, where we try to um, ease tensions. And what we see between Catalonia and Spain today is that there are a great many tensions, tensions between legality and a certain idea of democracy. And I think this is the right place to discuss those issues and uh, discuss how we can try to ease those tensions. Carlos Puigdemont, you are the face of a revendication. Carlos Puigdemont, you are the face of a, an independentist uh, claim, uh, which is unique in Europe. What does uh, being in Geneva and Switzerland represent for you? Well, thank you first and foremost for your invitation. Thank you for coming to listen to us. I fully subscribe to what I just heard. I would like it for this discussion to be able to be held in Madrid or in Barcelona under normal conditions. So what does Geneva represent? Well, normal conditions for democracy where you can share views among people who have differing opinions in a civilized fashion and through discussion people can seek an agreement, an agreement based on values which are very much exemplified by Geneva and Switzerland, respect, acknowledgement of the other, and the fact that everything must be worked on day after day. Nothing is written in stone. 
Geneva is the city of human rights. This shows a commitment to peace and mediation. So this is also an opportunity in the heart of this culture for mediation and respect for human rights to speak with freedom that would not be possible in Spain. I couldn't do this in Spain because I would be in prison. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate that you are speaking in French. Uh, the same is true of uh, Xavier Vidal Folk. Uh, Xavier is how it's pronounced in Catalan, n'est-ce pas? And it's Xavier in French. So, Xavier. Since you are one of the major journalists at El País and you are an opponent of uh, independence, what does this discussion here in Geneva represent for you? Well, I'm happy to be here. Not just because this is a plural and interesting discussion, but rather because it is being held here. Not everyone has gone crazy in Spain and in Catalonia. We discuss every day. We discuss on television. But the significance of discussing here in the cradle of human and humanitarian rights is very noteworthy. This is a country that was able to overcome its differences through a formula that consists in sharing power, but without s suppressing anyone, and also showing cohesion and solidarity, but while allowing for everyone to show their distinctiveness. In other words, a federal model. It is one of the types of federalisms that exist, and this is perhaps the most practicable horizon and a model. I am very pleased to be in Geneva for a personal reason. My sister, my daughter, rather, uh, did a master's degree in human and humanitarian uh, rights here, which uh, shows my age, but it also shows my love for dialogue, even if there are differences of opinion. I think all of us have our opinions. Uh, I think that uh, Carlos uh, Puigdemont said that he also sp spoke here a long time ago, so he also has a certain age. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Nicolas Lavrat. You had a report. You will speak on self-determination, but you will talk about the reason that you're in Geneva, in Switzerland. Thank you. That's right. Um, it's very important here in the framework of this festival to talk about this uh, very specific human right, the right to self-determination. This is a right which is designed to form a basis for dialogue and which underlies um, the democratic legitimacy of political authorities. And in the current structure of the international community, it's a human right that uh, is problematic because these fundamental rights are spelt out at international level, but states are responsible for implementing them. And the right to self-determination is a right to everybody but can only be exercised collectively in the context of a self-determination project in which uh, a people um, will take shape. So ask states to implement that right is a very difficult thing because this right actually challenges the very existence of states. So it's a right that cannot be implemented like other fundamental rights and uh, challenged in court, but it must be implemented in the context of a democratic discussion. It's the very basis of that discussion. So I think having that discussion here, now as you said earlier, this perhaps isn't the most appropriate uh, place, because that would have been one day uh, in Spain and Catalonia. Um, there are democratic legitimacies there, and uh, in Spain and Catalonia we'll have to discuss. But 
this is a fundamental right, which is at the basis of democratic discussion. Have we neglected the idea of a, sta of a nation too much? Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau talked about the idea of a nation here in Switzerland, and uh, he talked about that, and then uh, in um, 1948, and then in, after 45, people started saying that it was an old-fashioned uh, idea, and we see a lot of nationalisms emerging. Uh, have we neglected the idea of a nation? Well, we all know that uh, during the first half of the 20th century, there were some terrible abuses of nationalism, which led to uh, European and global conflicts. And that's why after 1945, we rebuilt Europe against nationalism of that type. But today, we are seeing the emergence uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so of a very interesting phenomena, either in Scotland or in Catalonia, and indeed in other places in Europe, where we see peoples who uh, want to have a collective political project together, uh, claiming that it is a national project, but within the European framework. So it's not that type of nationalism which led us to conflict. It's a nationalism which is an open type of nationalism. And we see that this is being expressed in a number of different European countries. Um, we see also a closed type of nationalism which is opposing it. So it's true that today, in a world where the neoliberal ideology has led us to privilege uh, individual rights, we have this need to find ways of uh, building collective societies again. And I think behind some of these uh, uh, neo-nationalist uh, movements, then we have that determination to build a collective society. Carlos Puigdemont, you speak very good French, thankfully, and the sense of the meaning of words is very important. You've just heard about nationalism, but what do you represent exactly? We've heard uh, secessionism, we've heard identity movement, nationalism, uh, independent uh, movement. What is the Catalan people for you? Well, I fully agree with the idea that uh, most Europeans um, have of the word nationalism. It's associated with war, xenophobia, and exclusion. So you're not a nationalist. Well, in that sense, not at all. Absolutely not. And most uh, Catalans, we are a very diverse people, built on successive waves of migration. There's a real mixture of languages, cultures. We're very open in that sense. Open-minded, and, 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 and thankfully so. It would be impossible to build a uh, movement based on ethnic uh, claims, for example, in, in Catalonia. That would be impossible. And then I'd like to say something very clearly, and that is if most Catalans tried to make a, an independent state, the, the Spain... Um, did with a different number, that I wouldn't be in, uh, an independence uh, supporter at all. But this is what most people uh, agree on. Uh, people who believe in that old form of nationalism, who think that they need to affirm themselves by way of opposition to somebody else, by neglecting others' rights, then that is a type of nationalism that I wouldn't agree with. And I would say that's a sovereignism and I would agree, I, I think citizens are more important. You need to give them the opportunity to try to build a country together. Not based on this old-fashioned uh, sacred idea of uh, unity which is decided by someone in the past, but as a project which we all can sign up to, to build something for the future generations improving quality of life, peace and democracy. I saw you in Brussels uh, a few days ago and I was shocked by what you said that uh, European elites f do not often hear this. They often uh, they say that, oh, the sovereignists are scared it's because of the crisis, etc. They uh, turn a deaf ear. Puigdemont, well, I realize that we are challenging the idea of a nation state with one language, one culture, one uh, view of the world. But I think that a lot of us agree that that is obsolete nowadays. So I understand that some states could consider that a threat, but even if there is some resistance, that 
the revision of that model is inevitable. That idea of a centralized power which has a great deal of uh, influence on all of our lives. Uh, now we have a very globalized world where people speak many languages and that no longer is applicable. Xavier, you are hearing that this is a uh, non-identity-based, uh, open uh, Catalan uh, sovereignty movement. Do you agree with that? What I have seen is that nationalists generally do not like to be called nationalist, be they Catalan nationalist, as you just heard, or Spanish nationalist, who in fact were partners for many years and uh, with a great deal of uh, chumminess and intensity with uh, Catalan nationalists until 2012. And what I have seen in Europe since the major recession is that there has been a mix of nationalists, uh, either state or uh, regional nationalist, and a certain type of populism. And this is something that you see everywhere. And this new creature, if you will, that you see in the UK, the pro-Brexit camp, you see it there. You see it in Catalonia as well. You see it in Italy with uh, the Lega. This polarizes the situation. They have almost an anti-system discourse or they ally themselves with anti-system forces, which is legitimate, although they don't like to be criticized for that either. And all of this leads to the use of a sort of new language To uh, it's in it's a it's a way of reassuring people, making them feel better after the crisis. It's a way to offer them solutions and certainties. If it were just that, it would not be a problem. However, if we were trying to implement that departure from Europe and from the state and finding enemies in the European Union or Spain or somewhere else, then we have a problem. Uh, Michelin, tell me, we heard that uh, there was a certain uh, sympathy in the, the left uh, from Switzerland for the uh, Catalan movement, and we just heard from him who said that it is a separatism, that it's uh, selfish, etc. Have you heard these two uh, positions? Yes. I am re reluctant to talk about uh, uh, a state nation as uh, a Swiss person because Switzerland has multiple languages, multiple religions, multiple ethnic groups. So we are a model of pluralism with a political system that allows for respect, not even for minorities because there are uh, no minorities. We have different constituent parts of Switzerland. All of us are treated the same, even though there are many fewer uh, uh, inhabitants in the French-speaking uh, side. We have our own uh, television station and even our own journalist, such as Press and Company. I have a huge problem thus with this idea of a nation state with one language, one culture, etc. And what I have gathered from the uh, Scottish or uh, Corsican or Catalan movements is that they are identity movements which are a sort of counterweight to globalization. The idea is to sort of find your bearings in your own territory. 
a culture comes from a, from a territory, according to that logic, and uh, also they want to have political representation in the area where they happen to be located. And so it is something that you see in these movements in Europe. And what is also interesting to note about the Catalan or Scottish movements is that they are in favor of the EU. So they are not against working in a plural fashion with other uh, sovereign states, but they want to have a back and forth. They want to be identified through their political institutions and those who represent them. And I think that that is something that is very interesting, and we will see more of this as time goes on. There is an idea which I believe is quite dangerous, and that is that there's a type of sacred unity as a sort of divine right that would give uh, certain peoples uh, the right to become a state, and others um, would be denied that right. Who um, decides who has the right to form a state? Um, not necessarily through wars, as was in the past, but because today states must be built on the will of their peoples, their citizens. And uh, that makes them legitimate and useful. Um, and they can be improved uh, as generations go by. There is no sacred unity. There is no religious uh, conviction uh, behind the idea of a, of a nation. And so people um, uh, say that there is in Catalonia, but this goes beyond um, democracy. Unity is a type of taboo sometimes. And you could even be uh, imprisoned for discussing unity in today's uh, Catalonia. And that is dangerous because that is to renounce a very fundamental idea of democracy. Because future generations must have the right to build the country um, that they believe is the right country to build. Not uh, what their grandfathers or grandparents thought. They must be free. And even the Catalan Republic must be um, capable of, of, of evolving. Nothing sacred or set in stone. So uh, I think that idea of sovereignty, not based on a divine right or an uh, unchallengeable right, but on the will of citizens, I think that is the idea that should be listened to and taken into account. But. Isn't that a little bit um, difficult uh, to accept when you see the violence, the hatred on both sides? You said a sacred right, but a sovereignist, uh, a nationalist uh, view is very clear in both camps. Nicola, this idea about each people choosing their future, don't we underestimate the power, or this, the strength of a national sentiment. Uh, where, oh, Putin was re-elected uh, uh, after the Russian elections. I'm a journalist. And we were all struck when we went to Russia, Serbia as well, and Israel and Palestine to see what you said at the beginning. And that is that the um, feeling of, people's, uh, of being a people, being a nation, is very strong. And we tend to underestimate that. Isn't that something greater or stronger than this uh, more positivist uh, vocation. No. I think the strength of this idea of the right to self-determination, the strength of democracy, is that it is the will of the citizens, the people, um, that legitimates, justifies power. Um, power doesn't uh, belong to a territory or to a government. But uh, the government is legitimate because it is the result of the collective will of the people. And each citizen uh, is entitled to participate in that political project. Now, you talked about violence. And obviously, violence is potentially dangerous. But if you look at the situation in Catalonia, we should underscore that there was very little violence been seen. So uh, it's quite remarkable in that sense. Unfortunately, history shows, generally speaking, that after violent crises, uh, the right to self-determination uh, can be enjoyed. 
So perhaps you're right there. It's quite idealistic to believe that through dialogue, through negotiation, um, you can reach uh, self-determination. If you look at the history of Switzerland, though, that has happened. There were no violent uh, conquests. There are different cantons who gradually decided to participate in that political project together. And Switzerland, as you said, is not a nation with a, the same religion, uh, the same ethnic origin, the same language. Um, there isn't a Swiss language, really. There is a Romance, though. But uh, apart from that, we speak the Italian's language, the French, the German. These are neighboring countries' languages. But we have the will, we have the determination to remain together. And that's respected. And I think that's a very important foundation to the state. And our country has expressed that will and for a long time now has decided not to use violence against its neighbors. Okay, um, listen to the other argument. Um, state, nation states who aren't really represented here. I don't know if you know that uh, example, uh, Metternich, the uh, Austrian uh, counselor, a conservative who uh, was very moved by the nationalist uh, poems from Germany. And he was very moved by that, but he censored them anyway, um, because he said, that's dangerous. And this is what uh, Mitterrand said in 1989. He said, uh, nationalism means war. And partially, he was right, in Yugoslavia anyway. Um, and this is what Mr. Macron says to a certain extent, and Ms. Madame Merkel, when they say, well, Catalan, okay, but uh, what about when the Corsicans decide to want to leave for um, uh, the regional minorities? So this is a bit like what you've been saying. Um, isn't there a real danger there, uh, in your view? Well, is Europe in a position to accept, formulate, or translate politically this diversity in a unity of action, the principle of subsidiarity and so on? Or is Europe just going to enter into a decline? What this means is you need to counter movements that try to break the economic status quo or the social status quo. And there you see the problem of migration in Germany or in France. Or it's a problem for certain Germans and certain French people, of course. Uh, there isn't a Catalan movement either, by the way. There are different movements with different views. But the alternative for Germany or Le Pen's movement are reactions that uh, are based on that uh, philosophy of uh, uh, turning inwards uh, towards a past identity. And they try to break a social model. And you see the same thing in Great Britain. So we need a deeper Europe where, e where each of us can progress rather than looking ourselves in the mirror. So the, is the independence movement in Catalonia dangerous or not for you? Well, that depends. What does it depend on? Well, Catalonia has been a wonderful success and so has Spain. Do you agree? Uh, Puch them on. Well, I'm not a historian. I can't say that. That depends. That depends as well, says the moderator. Let us hear what his argument is. We are Mediterraneans, but that was rather a thought and not so much a feeling. Spain, because Spain uh, became, went from dictatorship to democracy in an absolutely brilliant fashion. Bon. Merci. Thank you. As I was saying, in a brilliant fashion, the 1978 regime, you learned how to say that in Belgium because you're using the French numbers, said the moderator. As I was saying, it was a wonderful regime because we created a quasi-federal system. We made a 
tax system, which indeed uh, can be improved. Listen, if anyone uh, wants to uh, speak in my uh, place, then you can. Well, the moderator, if that is the case, then why is there so much lack of uh, acceptance? Well, regarding language, and I know that uh, this is something that my co-citizens agree with. I, my great grandfather was a, a translator of uh, Dent, Denti, and my generation was not able to learn Catalan in school. But my grandchildren have Catalan as the main school language. So that is a wonderful success story. Even with the problems of globalization and centralization, Catalonia has been able to keep its relationship not just with uh, Galicia and uh, Madrid, but also Juan Alp and other major areas in uh, in Europe, and was able to um, maintain its uh, economic situation. Is Franco not a problem in Spain, says uh, Dario Surspin, uh, Xavier. Who is Franco? Franco is buried. We buried the dictatorship. It's a little bit difficult to tell that, but the dictatorship was uh, uh, buried. But Spain is a consolidated democracy. Well, this uh, touches on a historic wound. Yes, we can go uh, back to that. But on this uh, main uh, point, is Franco still there? Puigdemont. Well, Franco is buried. But he is buried under a national monument because there is a monument which is funded publicly, which you can visit every day. It costs nine euros. You can uh, look at it on the uh, National Heritage website. And I am saying this because I just looked at it on the official website, the Spanish National Heritage. If you look on the section on the uh, Valley of the Fallen and you click on history, the Spanish government says that he was a head of state who was in power from 1939 till 1975. So he is there, paid by the state, uh, with a 2 million euro deficit, which has uh, been maintained over years. And on the other hand, the Republican fighters who were uh, killed during the dictatorship are not the subject of uh, m monuments. That being said, Xavier is right in the sense that we cannot uh, minimize the efforts that were made in Spain and the achievements made. But saying that it is a brilliant democracy without any problems, that is incorrect. It is true that there have been certain types of progress. But let us be honest, the language model that was just uh, highlighted by Mr. Vidal Folk is in peril right now. We have to fight constantly. Right now, it is impossible to get a, uh, a sentence in, in Catalan or go to uh, films in Catalan. I'm sorry, uh, says Darius. This is something that a lot of uh, Spaniards and Catalans are away, aware of. But there are lots of uh, French and uh, Germans and Italians who, and Swiss people who are listening. We thought that there was a lot of autonomy in Spain. What do you think is missing in this autonomous community? We, if you look on paper, uh, there is autom autonomy. The Constitution uh, and the statute uh, provide uh, an acceptable level of autonomy. But if you look at the reality, what happens in reality? The 
Catalan Parliament, uh, in the scope of its powers, hasn't been able to adopt uh, laws on uh, 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 fuel poverty, on uh, equality between men and women, on uh, digital policy against uh, um, evictions of um, and people uh, uh, the, against uh, the uh, trade register, uh, taxation on uh, bank deposits, or taxation on uh, uh, the uh, on, on uh, the greenhouse effect. So, why, if we have this autonomy, aren't we entitled to uh, set the um, opening hours of our shops? You don't believe that at all, do you? or you don't see it that way. It's true that the quality of the legislative activity of the Catalan parliament uh, can, could be improved. Uh, there might be um, a policy on the part of the Madrid uh, government, but that is another nationalist uh, uh, fringe. But sometimes legislation is adopted uh, and it uh, goes beyond the uh, jurisdiction of uh, the autonomous uh, community. And then you can't turn around and complain because um, that is refused or rejected. Mr. Puigdemont, my compatriot, says um, that I was not very nuanced in my position in what I said about the transition. And I can say that I have published uh, books on this issue, and uh, they were very nuanced. And I like to be nuanced in the way I approach things. Uh, you are entitled as a politician to um, criticize journalists, journalists, and journalists can criticize politicians. I have no problem with that criticism. But before being nuanced, should we also should we also should we also say, well, we've done a great job. Of course, um, there are difficulties. There always are, both internally within the Catalan side, it's very difficult to establish an agreement between the different uh, separatist separatist groups. And they're still waiting for an agreement uh, three months after the elections, and then between the Catalans and Spanish. Of course, there are difficulties, but you need to work on these things. You need to try and improve the situation by pointing out what's wrong. I agree with that, but I do think the system is right. So you're talking about the Spanish state being the system is right. So is it possible to stay within the Spanish uh, state and have the two flags? We'll talk about the Jura in a moment. That's something else in Switzerland. There are many uh, elements in common, more so than you might think. Two flags, the Jura flag and the Swiss flag, that would be acceptable. Would it be acceptable to have the Catalan flag and the Spanish flag for you? Well, just to try to calm down the situation a little bit, I remember that Miss Merkel was elected as chancellor after five months of uh, discussions after the election. So that's more or less the same time frame that we're looking at in Catalonia. And I would remind you that in Spain, they had to have uh, legislative elections again uh, on a, uh, for a second time because no agreement was reached to establish a government. So having said that, it's not a question of the flag, honestly. The flag isn't the issue here. Allow me to tell you a story. Many of my um, independent supporters have criticized this. I decided not to take the Spanish flag down from the Generalitat building on the 27th of uh, October. And that was a conscious decision because at the end of the day, the Spanish flag is an important part of Catalonia because that's a symbol. And it's not a good uh, way, uh, by declaring a republic, to immediately um, do something um, that would attack uh, an important symbol for many of my compatriots. But you did uh, proclaim independence, so that's a, a strong symbol uh, against the state. But one, 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 on one hand, you have the state, but then you have the tools of the state to uh, manage your affairs, and then identity-related symbols. Everyone should have the right to their identity, even in an independent Catalonia. OK, let's move on to the issue of uh, dialogue, um, if there is a possibility for dialogue. And we'll talk about a Swiss example. This made people laugh here, but let's talk about the Jura. The Jura region, 
is uh, one case. Now explain the different votes that took place there. This is a very important issue. Um, is it just Catalonia that should be voting on this, or is it the whole of the Spanish state? Could you just remind us of, about how this happened in, in, in the Jura and in Switzerland? This is a, a, a state within a state was created. Well, that's right. There was a, a series of votes. Four different uh, votes took place. Uh, and the canton of Bern had to vote twice. Um, there was a lot of tension. And there was a situation where um, we needed to find a solution. And it didn't uh, get into a standstill forever. Um, there was a decision in the canton of Bern to recognize the right of the people of Jura to self-determination. I remind you that uh, the issue of whether or not Jura would be in Switzerland or in France was also an issue that was discussed. The vote was in favor, so the, the people of Bern said the, Jura, the people of the Jura can have this vote. And then you went ahead with a vote uh, in each commune. Uh, some of the French-speaking communes within the canton of Bern voted. Some communes decided to stay in the canton of Bern, and others decided to leave the canton of Bern. And that is what will, those cantons will, those communes will make up the future canton of Jura. Now this led to a new vote in the canton of Bern to uh, agree to accept that result, to accept the fact that part of the canton of Bern would leave. And those communes got together and set up a new canton, which was the canton of Jura. And when that was created, they adopted their constitution. We had to modify the federal, Swiss federal constitution to recognize the outcome of that process. And then once again, the people of the canton of Bern, not alone, um, voted, like the canton of Geneva, the canton of Zurich, and the other cantons, and they accepted that result. So it was a democratic process, but it wasn't a single vote. Um, I think the idea that a single vote can uh, sustainably resolve this type of issue um, is just too simplistic. Unfortunately, these processes tend to be very complex and long. Xavier, uh, your reaction. I spoke to you on the phone the other day, and uh, you, you laughed at this issue of the Swiss coming along with their solution. Uh, is that fair? With the microphone, please. Could you apply that model to Spain? Well, I think there are different traditions, of course. That's what you think. The, there are different constitutions. It's true that if you discussed uh, in Jura the issue of whether or not to go to France or S Switzerland, that discussion took place, and there was an evolution. Uh, uh, or there was this transfer of sovereignty internally. The big issue wasn't uh, really self-determination in terms of the desire to actually leave the, the country of Switzerland. But there are countries with a similar situation to ours. Switzerland has to direct democracy, referendums, and uh, they have referendums on virtually everything, and that's great. And I think it really is uh, wonderful for Switzerland, but Switzerland is a very different country, and I think that's, uh, th that's great. But the German constitution doesn't just forbid successionist movements, but referendums are forbidden as well. The Italian constitution does the same thing. Two uh, rulings of the Italian Constitutional Court in 2015 uh, were uh, of that opinion, and in 2016. So we need to take that into account. And then, if you allow me, I just have, a, have another question I'd like to raise. Spain is an invention of Catalonia, and that might seem strange uh, to many of our Catalan friends, but the internal market was built by Catalans in Spain. Uh, the employers' movement, uh, which was founded in Barcelona, the anarchist uh, trade union um, was also founded in Barcelona, the socialist uh, unions, and indeed the socialist party was founded in Barcelona. There was the in industrial revolution that took place in Barcelona. 
the uh, car manufacturers are there, and the Congress uh, on, uh, of car manufacturers takes place there. So even with our faults, that was what happened. That's the truth. Well, let us turn to Carlos Puigdemont, because uh, this uh, Swiss example, does that inspire you? Absolutely. Because regardless of what system you choose to uh, settle differences, because there will be disputes in any democratic society, should be based on respect. And what we hear in the cases that we have just heard about, there is an enormous level of respect, uh, political empathy, and recognition of the other. As long as you do that, then anything is possible. And there are many lessons to be learned from Switzerland. How to deal with uh, linguistic and cultural diversity, complexity. That is truly praiseworthy. It shows that uh, that it's possible, even if it requires a certain level of tinkering. It must cost a lot of money, but it it is something that can be done. And citizens are placed at the center of decision making. Everyone is respected. So would you be in favor of all of Spain voting? In a uh, conference that I held in Madrid, they asked the same question. I said, First of all, are you willing to vote on the independence of Catalonia? And they said, no, 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 not uh, independence. Well, that is significant. If, if you had been willing to accept the right of Catalonia to become independent, then that would have already been progress. Secondly, is there a proposal on the table from the Spanish government saying that our proposal uh, can be accepted or do they have an alternate proposal? We are listening. Uh, we asked Rajoy, is there a counter offer on the part of the Spanish government? Obviously, our solution is independence, but it is not the only uh, possible one. We have to work just like uh, David Cameron, who uh, actually played the game and won. But uh, it was impossible to uh, win in Spain. Ms. Calmibre, yes, I think that when it comes to Jura and other uh, self-determination processes or independence processes, is that they come after the end of a dialogue and an exchange. And after a collective political expression, and it might come after years, as was the case in Jura. But regarding whether uh, you would be willing or be in favor of Spain voting on uh, the uh, constitutional change, I th and it's funny that they asked you. I think that that question can only be asked after a dialogue. It cannot be asked at the beginning because self-determination processes do not necessarily culminate in succession. It can lead to autonomy within a national territory, such as in, in Spain. It can offer a certain amount of freedom and uh, competencies. Uh, in a particular area, but that requires negotiation. In fact, I think that when it comes to Catalonia, one of the major aspects is uh, fiscal autonomy, the ability to collect taxes. If everything that you do on your territory depends on uh, what comes to you from above, then you have no autonomy to decide what you want to do. And that's no real autonomy at all. So we could look at how we establish a discussion and exchange between Catalonia and uh, Spain before the idea of constitutional amendment could really be considered. Oh, 
I would like to just tinker with the argument made by Xavier Vidal Folkra, my compatriot. And it makes sense because we're both journalists as well. There could be uh, recognition of a state f without borders. It's true that the Italian country, that the Italian constitution does not recognize uh, succession. But right next to us, there is a country called Portugal that does recognize that right. So there are all types of possibilities within European constitutions to exercise self-determination, which, by the, by the way, was recognized by Spain in 1976 when it signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I have a quiz question. Who said the main uh, problems of uh, peoples are only dealt with by force? Who was it? It was uh, Lenin, but I digress. Uh, I would like to talk about violence because this is something which needs to be dealt with. Uh, it is true that there are people in prison. There was political violence in autumn. You would be immediately arrested if you cross the Spanish borders, so not all is rosy, so that violence, that idea that uh, violence could be useful because it drew attention to the cause, how do we deal with that violence? I am very critical of the abuses that have occurred like the police intervention on the 1st of October. Having said that, there is a quasi-mythical version of uh, the events that day, which uh, forgets conveniently the um, slightly less serious abuses that uh, were committed by the government of Catalonia. Um, the predecessors of Mr. Puigdemont in uh, 2011, when on the 15th of May, the 15M uh, uh, movement uh, overstepped uh, the mark. And then after 2012, uh, Este Quintana's eye was uh, removed. Our autonomous police uh, very sadly, I'm saying this because they should have been an example of a new police force. Okay, well, we don't want to get into too many details, but you think that there was some provocation on both sides, is that right? The film tells a story which I believe is incomplete. Okay, on that very specific issue of violence, Carlos Puigdemont. Well, if the only way of becoming an independent state is uh, through violence, then that would be a collective failure. Catalans have given their commitment over many years now to a non-violent, peaceful movement to um, request uh, to exercise their right to self-determination. And I think in Europe, we should be showing an example that is not just through violence that uh, you can become an independent state. Having said that, I think a level of violence has been seen that is unacceptable in 21st century Europe. This was a systematic violation of the fundamental rights of the European Union, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and the uh, uh, International Covenant of uh, Civil and Political Rights, which is a UN instrument. This is very regrettable. It's a great shame that a judge can uh, request preventive detention for peaceful leaders of peaceful movements. Uh, if you look back at this history, these people have shown their commitment to peaceful means, continuing to support independence. And we need to see an end to that, because this is no way to resolve problems. You can't use the criminal code 
you should be using political means to resolve political problems. So what is your approach today? Sometimes I get the impression that you are drifting between different uh, procedures. I remember asking Afar Arafat in uh, Tunis. There was a, uh, a we were in a cella and there was a beautiful poster behind him. And I said, when you are pa Palestinian president, and he said, I am Palestinian president. And I said, well, no, not quite. And I get the impression that you feel that in your house in Waterloo. Uh, you, you're quite a long way from being an actual president. Uh, this is a serious question. Are you already president of Catalonia? Or do you want to maintain this dialogue uh, to become president of Catalonia? What do you think? Well, I am still um, the president elected by the Catalan parliament because the Catalan parliament has not removed uh, its trust from me. Through Spanish law, that it would be the only possibility for me to be removed from office as president. I have uh, lodged a complaint against the Spanish state because they've taken an illegal decision, anti-constitutional decision. And so for as long as the president, uh, for as long as a new president has been elected by the parliament, I continue to be president. And just two weeks ago, the parliament, uh, with an absolute majority, decided to reiterate its trust in my presidency. Je veux pas entrer. I do not want to get bogged down in this point because I think that everyone, even when you are very much uh, involved in these uh, types of uh, causes, that everyone has the right to their relics, if you will. But I think we need to be very clear cut on a, an aspect. We have been very nuanced t up until now, but I think that there is a radical aspect which absolutely must be clarified in this auditorium tonight. October 1st, which was a sad day on multiple levels. came almost one month after the successionist majority of the Catalan parliament voted on disconnection laws, which were fundamentally illegal, not just under the Constitution, but also under the Catalan Regional Charter. Procedure is key in democracy. To reform Catalonia's regional charter, you need a qualified majority. Article 222. Uh, and this, however, was uh, decided upon by 51% of the parliament. So this was a legislative coup d'etat, which uh, went against the Constitution and the Regional Charter, the Constitution which was accepted by more than 90% of uh, Catalans uh, in 1978. I think that we have two different visions of legality, and we are not going to delve too much in this, but I think that what we should ask is if one or the other uh, sides can take a step what should it be? Well, I think that first and foremost, we should respect the October 1st result because that's not exactly a step. Uh, that would rather be a step for the other side to take. Well, that would be a good start because, of course, they should also release the political prisoners and let the those who are exiled to return. That would be very good for both Spain and Catalonia because it is a political anomaly currently. They are, it is saying that it's a crime to allow for the Catalan people to decide on their future. And so we should definitely resolve that uh, situation. Now, dialogue as well is 
very much desirable. And there is a professor in Madrid who is very much attached to democracy. He says that in democracy, if there is not a right to dialogue, then uh, the democracy itself doesn't exist. There is something to be seen in, in the Catalan position. There are two million people who demonstrate every single year. It has a, an economic and uh, economic and uh, cultural power. Well, there can also be politics in Spain, and so we, the idea of discussing the right of Catalans to decide on their future would be a good step forward. Xavier, what step could the central Spanish government take? Well, we have an extremely difficult predicament, namely the coercive measures and I'm referring to uh, remanding politicians into preventative custody. I have said on multiple occasions that this is can be criticized, but these are the judges who drafted the orders to send them to prison. And in a democracy, you cannot say, oh, the government should release people from prison or facilitate their freedom from prison. I wish that that were possible, but that is not a competence of the government. That is not within its jurisdiction. The judges, they can make mistakes, but those are the rules of democracy. Even if we don't like their decision, or even if it is a mistaken decision. So once we accept that, it is very difficult to establish a dialogue. I think that dialogue is never impossible. We could say to the public prosecutor that they should be more flexible. And I'm not referring to the judges. But we could say, oh, the trial should speed up and end as quickly as possible. But again, there were two laws in September. There was a Polish law where the, the president would be able to decide who would decide who would be the chief justice of the court and would be able to nominate the majority of judges. We cannot accept that in a democracy. Well, I think now we could pass to uh, the Q&A, but Michelin, uh, I would like to say uh, a few words, if you would allow me, by quoting someone uh, else. There were elections. There was a majority. And I think that the next uh, step is a uh, constitution of a uh, successionist uh, state because they won the elections. And then there needs to be a dialogue with Madrid, even though that will be difficult. Is that dialogue possible between Madrid and Catalonia? If it is possible, wonderful. And if so, it will be a Spanish uh, matter. But if not, will there be intervention from, say, for example, the European Union? Because the EU is not just any old international organization. It has citizens. No one has moved thus far. Juncker said he didn't want 98 European states. Indeed, because if in the EU, states are in charge of politics, and they are very much scared 
of the uh, Catalan uh, president, and so they are not likely to offer their help. And so this brings us back to uh, Spain, and so there needs to be a constitution of a separatist government and then a dialogue with uh, with um, Spain. So it would be a the Catalan government, uh, which won the elections, they would have to f form a government and then start a dialogue with uh, Spain. We shouldn't forget that the vice president of the Spanish government said publicly that the government had imprisoned the uh, separatist Catalan leaders. We shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget that the attorney general is appointed by the government. And the judge was for the dog democracy came out with a ruling or a, a communique which said that there were calls between the Spanish government and the constitutional court. And the government told them what should be done uh, in the context of my candidacy for re-election as president. So that is no way um, to, set, to go ahead with government and respect the separation of powers. Of course, there is a problem um, setting up government in Catalonia. A member of the Catalan parliament uh, chosen by the majority of uh, Catalan uh, deputies cannot become president because a judge has forbidden uh, him uh, to be released from prison because there was an interpretation um, of the uh, uh, Spanish government that a member of parliament um, who can't be present uh, in parliament, even if he's in prison, can be elected president. So there's a contradiction. Uh, before I open this up to the floor, Nicolas Levra, you uh, are a Swiss uh, jurist, and uh, you understand uh, that it's very difficult for each side to take the step in the right direction. But you know Catalonia very well. What would you say? Well, you can't defend the right to self-determination. Uh, the right to peoples um, to self-determination then come from somewhere else and tell them what they should do. But I would just like to come back to one point on this argument of legality, which is uh, used by the government in Madrid very often, and that is that uh, the law that uh, modified the competence of the Constitutional Court was brought before the Commission of Venice of, Venice of the um, Council of Europe, and the Commission of Venice said that that law um, risked uh, violating a series of fundamental principles uh, of the European Human Rights Convention, and the government from Madrid Give, gave its commitment for that law not to be used against Catalan leaders, and that did happen. So there's a problem of legitimacy as well as legality. And since the end of the Second World War in Europe, you can no longer simply invoke legality without taking into account the legitimacy of decisions as well. Professor, I think, honestly, that you are wrong in that respect. Because the Constitutional Court did not use the new powers since the reform that were criticized by the Venice Commission. And the Venice Commission said that the referendum that was being envisaged at that time, before the 1st of October, was not consistent with um, international law and the code of uh, good practice of the Venice uh, Commission of the Council of Europe. They criticized rulings of the Constitutional Court, but they drafted those rulings without using the powers that were criticized by the Venice Commission. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you because uh, quite clearly the solution will not just be a legal one or a legal uh, one. Clearly, there are other elements that need to come into play. Well, there, is, uh, there are two uh, legal uh, uh, views uh, in, uh, clashing here. No, I think we all agree that dialogue must take place within an institutional legal framework. Oh, maybe not. Well, I would just remind you that as president of Catalonia, over the past uh, two years, uh, I've asked for dialogue. Uh, there was a Catalan government asking for dialogue, and that wasn't enough to set dialogue in motion. 
So there's no guarantee that uh, if we set up a new government, then Madrid will decide all of a sudden that uh, it would like uh, to have a dialogue which it hasn't wanted over the past two years. Oh, I would like to open up the discussion now, so please do uh, not take up too uh, long when you uh, have the microphone, and please be courteous and show respect uh, to the radically different positions up here on the stage. Um, please raise your hand and please uh, do ask a brief question, and I would ask you uh, here as panelists to respond fairly briefly as well so that we can have a, an interaction discussion. Yes, Professor, go ahead. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a question. Self-determination is uh, an expression that's very curious because to be a state you have to be recognized. So after you become independent, will other states recommend you? because this was the situation with Kosovo. Not every state recognized them. Yes, and if you would allow me to ask a, uh, another question, it didn't seem like people were running to help you. Well, this is the case of every previous independence. This is what happened with Slovenia, for example. They said, we would never recognize you, and six months later, it was recognized. So it is true that at the beginning, there is no country that recognizes independence. It is a process. But bearing experience in mind, in the majority of cases, there is ultimately recognition. This was not the case of Kosovo, because some countries in Europe, in the EU, Spain, uh, namely, which did not recognize Kosovo. But does that mean that Kosovo cannot become a state? Well, eventually political reality will be imposed, will be decisive. Good afternoon. I would like to ask a question of Mr. Puigdemont. March 1st, you gave up your candidacy for the presidency, and you put forward Jordi Sanchez, who is in uh, prison, or Mr. Turuy, who is uh, indicted. You know perfectly that that is illegal and that Coop would definitely veto those two candidacies. Catalonia, meanwhile, is still under the effects of Article 155, which means that there is still no government. Do you think that this helps uh, Catalonia's economy, that it eases people's uh, sensibilities, and that it helps uh, Catalonia overcome its division? Well, I didn't put forward Mr. Turuy. I put forward Mr. Sanchez. And it is not actually illegal to put forward a member of the Catalan Parliament who has all of their parliamentary rights because there is no sentence saying the opposite. They have, he has every right to be elected uh, president. In any case, when what the judges are doing uh, is actually a crime, and that is what we are complaining about. Now, Article 155 is being implemented in an abusive, illegal way against all of Catalan uh, citizens. The, and I would like to say that intervening in our finances happened a long time before the implementation of Article 155. So Catalonia's economy is being affected not just by Article 155, but also the Ministry of Economy in Spain intervening in the economy. Yes, um, sir, you in the back. Well, good afternoon, good night to everyone. Mr. Puigdemont, I have a question. Given that there is no solution that came out of the referendum, would it perhaps be a good time to 
have the country become a federal Spanish state and not to separate, but actually to bring peoples together and not create a war like in Yugoslavia? Well, we don't want to have a war. Uh, we've shown our strong commitment to peaceful uh, action. Asking for a vote is not using violence. It's an instrument of expression of democratic will. The history of the independence of people shows that you can become independent um, if you are very, very united and you can collaborate with other countries in that way. And uh, the experience of Spain shows uh, that uh, they were collaborating with their former colonies, which became independent, and that shows that it is very possible to continue to collaborate uh, with those countries, because that is uh, what has been decided. But you're right. There may be other possibilities. But what I would like to say very clearly is that has Spain does, done its duty? Is there a plan for the future of Catalonia that we can discuss about? There is a plan for Catalonia. Um, we are proposing uh, a state. That's our um, position. And I've asked uh, Mr. Rajoy on several occasions, do you have a plan that we can start to discuss for Catalonia? And all he said is the current status quo. But you, it's clear that the status quo doesn't work. So there's a political problem. So of course, you're right. We need to explore uh, other possibilities. But they're not on the table. Thank you. You will have the opportunity to ask questions in a moment. Please. Good evening. I have a question for you, Mr. Puigdemont. In a hypothetical uh, independent Catalonia, would you, in a hypothetical uh, independent Catalonia, Mr. Puigdemont, would you agree to have uh, independence referendums uh, in regions? And what would be the limits to that? Would you have a referendum just for Girona, for the small villages, for uh, a, a bakery in a mer? Uh, this is the model that we were talking about earlier with regard to the Jura. Each commune, each commune would vote. Well, I support the idea that uh, nothing is sacred, nothing is set in stone. Uh, if uh, sometime in the future uh, a number of uh, citizens in a particular place wanted to organize such a referendum, then I am convinced that they should be entitled to do so. But, and they shouldn't be put in prison for asking for that. I think that's very, very important. And the second thing, we shouldn't forget that the Catalan Parliament has already put that idea into practice because we approved the Vatalan law with uh, uh, which is very important. It's a language that belongs to the Occitan family, and uh, it was recognized. Uh, the, 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 the right to self-determination of Adelan was, was recognized. Merci. The lady in red. Good evening to everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I have a question for the professor. Do you think that what the police did in that uh, school was democratic when they broke the windows there? And Mr. Puigdemont, I think you're alone, but I support you as a Galician in your approach, because Europe, for me, is not a Europe of peoples. It's a Europe of technocrats. And that's why peoples uh, should uh, start to come out into the streets. And that's why I'm hopeful, because in Spain that's happening. Women are coming out of the streets, pensioners as well. And so, who do you mean by professor? There are lots of professors up here. I think you're the professor, uh, Nicolas. I think you're the professor tonight. So, no, I think you're the professor, actually. La violence policière. So, police violence, was that democratic? That's the lady's question. Well, I think, as I just said, I think there were abuses, uh, unacceptable abuses. At any rate, there are more than 12 complaints before the courts and judges will be responsible for determining uh, the outcome of uh, those complaints and uh, to what extent those abuses were serious. But can we say that Italy isn't a democracy? Having seen uh, even greater violence, 
there, uh, perpetrated by police officers uh, at the G20 meeting in uh, Genoa. Uh, I don't think we can argue that. I think the, there are different democratic models and they can all be improved on. Uh, there are always mistakes that are made. But what's important is that there are uh, methods and tools for correcting those mistakes, reviewing them, reviewing the political mistakes, and moving forward. And elections are an instrument or a tool. Um, they can also be used to correct those mistakes. Do you understand that uh, in Europe, we are struck by the degree of tension in Spain when your king, for example, um, clearly takes up a position which is against the uh, Catalan independence movement, uh, irrespective of who is right or not. In Europe, we say, well, there again, in Western Europe, uh, there is a nationalist issue which hasn't been resolved. There is verbal uh, violence, and, and all of this is very uh, surprising for us. Well, if there hadn't been two anti-constitutional laws adopted that were inconsistent with the statute, then that intervention by the king uh, wouldn't have been required. Secondly, what the king said, I think, is a, do a democratic doctrine of, of, of the rule of law. That's not what you believe, uh, Mr. Puigdemont. And that is clearly uh, acceptable. Um, but I would have liked the king to talk more specifically to the people who are represented in this audience tonight um, and say that he was the head of state of all of them and therefore that he uh, had sympathy for all of them, even if he didn't agree with a particular region. I think there was also a question from Mr. Puigdemont on the European issue. We, uh, gracias. Uh... Yes, thank you very much. I also believe in a Europe of citizens. That is my homeland, the Europe of citizens. We must not underplay the crisis that Europe is going through. We have to deal with it because there is generalized discontent, and I am very much concerned because some people do not share the same idea of uh, democracy that, that our ancestors have worked to build. And it's something that we have to deal with. We should not talk about populism because there is an expression of generalized discontent, and that's something that we need to address. There is a growing distance between European institutions and citizens, and that is not a good development. We have to correct it. Anyone else? Yes, sir? Good uh, night, uh, President of the Generalitat of Catalonia. We saw in this very interesting uh, documentary that even La Liberation uh, journalist described you as a very limited person. I think that Rajoy is very limited in his way of reading the Constitution because he could read it in a wider way, but he is very limited. But I think that you and the people that you represent, the two million people who have peacefully assembled, who are asking to be heard, you've been a lesson for all of us. Comparing the level of violence uh, on one side and the others is uh, unfeasible because it's, there is no comparison. And so I would like to know, Xavier, I can't remember your last name. You criticize that violence, but uh, you uh, criticize the uh, outcome of that violence. And I would like to know, when in El País did you criticize that violence? 
Puigdemont. Yes, indeed. We are concerned because citizens did what they had to do. They voted massively in very adverse conditions with leaders in prison, leaders in exile, with a climate of fear, with high school teachers brought before the uh, prosecutors for holding discussions about violence. And it is true that if there is not an agreement among the uh, sovereignty forces that the population is going to ask, well, we did our role. What are, what are you doing? But it's not that easy because we are trying to acknowledge the need for there to be a government to start working immediately while at the same time respect the outcome of the vote in December. In other words, this uh, clear majority in favor of the Catalan Republic. Xavier, when did you uh, condemn the violence in El País? I don't remember the exact day because I don't have the article in my back pocket. But at the end of February, I published uh, three pages with a colleague which was called uh, The Erosion of Institutions. It had three colony, colon, columns, and it uh, criticized the arbitrary actions of the police. If you want a copy, I will uh, gladly uh, send it to you. We can still take uh, one or two questions. Perhaps you, sir, uh, wearing white. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, as a constitutional expert, uh, Mr. Vidal Folk, could you please explain what the origin of the Article 2 of the uh, Constitution in Spain, which says that it's in dissolvable, that uh, comes from La Moncloa in Spain. So let us not uh, continue this myth that we can't possibly talk about this. And furthermore, I would like to talk about the editorial line of uh, El País because I grew up with El País and I loved it. But I've seen that there are a lot of uh, comments which are not just critical but actually uh, have been. Uh, quite insulting, which has uh, led to more independentism. I know people who have become independentists just because they kept reading El País. Thank you. Xavier. Xavier. The first question was about the, uh, the deterioration of El País, which has not been objective enough. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, well, I think Article 2 of the Constitution is not exactly a candidate for a Nobel uh, Prize for Literature because it's very repetitive, etc., and badly written. But it is an imperfect expression of the agreement that was made in 1978. On one hand, we are not going to we are not going to fight against the uh, unity or the union of the Spanish people. And on the other hand, we will give you a significant amount of self-governance. I think that that is truly an asset. It can be improved, yes. But I said before that Catalans have made significant achievements, and one of those was Article 8 of the Spanish Constitution, or Section 8, which says that Spain has an, a state with autonomies, which allowed for us to move forward in many areas. Regarding El País, well, I think that the law is not the end-all, be-all, but it is indeed a prerequisite for dialogue and progress because otherwise it would be the wild, wild west. Uh, 
Perhaps El País has been quite harsh in advocating for this idea, but we cannot break the democratic law. We cannot break the Constitution, and we cannot break the regional charter. And I agree that that's not just something that I've said in an editor. I believe in reforming law. And El País is in favor of a federal reform. But if you look at an editorial that I just uh, that just came out two weeks ago, it's called Language of Spain. In other words, it's saying Catalan is a language of Spain, and it was a full page. So perhaps you should uh, review your ideas about my uh, newspaper. I know that for Sp Spaniards, it, this is still quite early, but it's uh, still quite late for us in Switzerland. Madam in purple, I'm trying to uh, hear from uh, different points of view. We've had a lot of critical uh, opinions uh, for... Uh, Good evening. I'm not Spanish. I don't have any Spanish relatives, even. But I heard uh, something that really struck me and shocked me tonight, and that's why I've uh, wanted to ask this question. And I'm sorry if this is going to open up a, a longer uh, discussion on other aspects, but my question is the following. Do you think that uh, we can have a dialogue and build the future without uh, facing up to the past? Allow me to explain that very briefly. I saw a film last night talking about um, people seeking justice. Um, as the victims of the Franco regime, and they want uh, uh, graves to be opened up. They want, uh, uh, well, women want to find their babies or um, open up uh, the files. But because of the amnesty laws, people can't uh, lodge uh, legal complaints in that regard in Spain. So do you really think that without talking about the past, without facing up to the past, and we saw some of this in the film, um, we can really... Um, have a dialogue uh, that's worth a paper it's written on. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, because I felt that as well during the discussion, uh, irrespective of the position you might have. When uh, someone mentioned uh, General Franco, we felt that um, something very strong was happening and that uh, we were touching upon something that still has a lasting uh, impact in Spain, obviously more than in other countries in Europe. So is that still a problem affecting um, life today in Spain? And I'm not talking about whether or not you're pro-independence, but what do you feel about the, the legacy of Franco? Well, it's a question that is related to dignity. You need to deal with the wounds of the past to be dignified, and it's unacceptable that there are thousands of families in Spain who still don't know uh, the whereabouts of uh, the remains of their grandfathers, fathers, or brothers. That's just un unacceptable. Um, it's unacceptable that there are no public um, spokesmen out there leading campaigns to recover the memories of those families. And it's just so disappointing that that is the case now in 2018. It's unacceptable that um, there continue to be thousands of families who aren't treated like uh, equal citizens because they have not been able to recover the remains of their um, family members. And that is the strong sign that uh, we haven't um, reconciled uh, with the past and that has been one of the failures of the transition in Spain. You also suffered uh, from the history, history of uh, Franco. When you heard that question, what, what is your reaction? Well, politics can be the best or the worst. And I remember, I think, the laws on historical memory that were adopted under the socialists 
um, were, were good laws in order to try to uh, heal the last remaining wounds um, of the past. And then the process slowed down and was even blocked. But there are always possibilities within which to work, um, according to what uh, my dear compatriot was just saying, through uh, uh, local town councils, for example, uh, through the mayors of local uh, of, of small villages. But otherwise, I think a serious country needs to give precedence to Pactus Sun Savanna. And our transition may not have been perfect, but it was built on an agreement not to reopen uh, the crimes of the past. And to create an inclusive, open democracy for all. And I think that agreement has worked reasonably well. And we should uh, go forward on the basis of these laws of historical memory. But uh, we need to be serious about this. Back to some Savannah. I'm sorry to have to say this, but Mission Kamere, you've been uh, listening to this. Uh, you have uh, considerable political experience. Everyone, I think, has been struck by the weight of uh, history. What would be your conclusion? Well, it's very difficult to conclude uh, as a, an external observer, really, to a certain extent. But I would say what I've already said, and that is that you need to strive to find dialogue and for dialogue to be possible between Madrid and Barcelona. First of all, you need to uh, set up a separatist government because the separatists won the elections. Elections uh, took place in a, fair, a free and fair manner and uh, a separatist government needs to be set up. And that would be the precondition for a dialogue with Madrid. But the remaining outstanding issue, which can't be resolved here, is can um, the Spanish resolve this among uh, themselves? Can they initiate this dialogue? Or do they require external support? The European Union clearly is not ready um, to um, play that role. I would have thought that that would be good for the European Union to call for dialogue and a peaceful solution. But we didn't hear them say that. We just heard uh, states uh, expressing the fact that they were afraid of a precedent. And uh, so there was a deafening silence from their part. So it's clearly impossible from the European Union. So the question remains open. Some think that uh, these may be Spanish internal issues that should be resolved in Spain. Uh, that would be the best uh, solution, in my view. And I think that they have enough political experience um, to do that. Uh, but get into a dialogue without preconditions and with a determination to succeed. Because I think the solution for Catalonia isn't succession, but uh, greater autonomy within the framework of the Spanish state. Could I just thank very sincerely uh, the panelists. Uh, I didn't know Catalonia or Spain very well, and uh, I thought there was a lot of human warmth on both sides here. Um, I th saw there a lot of camaraderie, and I thought that uh, this was a very generous and uh, polite discussion, and I recognized many people in the room who were Catalans and Spanish, uh, and I thought that this was um, a very, very uh, emotional time. And I was also struck by the degree of extreme tension. Uh, destinies uh, may be changed radically by this process. And I thought that you were very dignified and courteous in the debate. And then finally, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the International uh, Festival um, for providing us with this opportunity. This is the closing, uh, closing evening, um, not from within the organization of the festival myself. But um, I'd just like to thank you. And uh, could we have a round of applause um, for the festival? Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Merci à toutes. Merci à tous.
Thank you. Thank you all. Merci. Bien, merci. Merci à Thank you uh, so much. This is the end of the festival, the International Film Festival and Forum on Human Rights. I would like to thank the whole team of the festival. I won't be able to name them all, but I'm so thankful to all of those who've made this festival possible. Of course, uh, tomorrow morning we'll get to work on uh, working on the next uh, 2019 edition of the festival. Thank you very much for taking place and taking part in this discussion. Thank you, Darius. Have a, have a wonderful evening and uh, see you all again soon. Je vous présenter Anne-Claire Adé. Anne-Claire Adé, who is my uh, deputy at the forum, Isabel Gatteke, of course, 